the other day, an undergraduate cornered me in Harvard Yard and asked what all this was leading up to, all these musico-linguistical meditations of the last two lectures. What am I getting at, she asked. Do I really believe in the analogies I suggest between transformational grammar and musical transformations? And I was very brave and stoutly responded, yes, I deeply believe in the analogies. And I found that this linguistic approach to poetry illuminates musical analysis and vice versa. And in fact, so have some linguists I've heard from, much to my pleasure. And as far as what I'm getting at is concerned, it's a broad, dispassionate look at the musical crisis of our own century as dramatized by Charles Ives' unanswered question, and analogously, how poetry shares in that crisis. But my bright new friend was only warming up her inquisition. I follow your linguistics, she said, but uh, you begin to lose me when you start crossing Chomsky with aesthetics. How does transformational grammar lead to the beauty of ambiguity, as you put it, is being a little bitchy, and to increased aesthetic response. Aren't you being a bit ambiguous yourself? Hmm. I was suddenly not so facile in my response and found myself defensively trying to recall my original enthusiasms and impulses when I first conceived these lectures. I reminisced phonology, syntax, semantics, meaning. Ah, meaning. OK, I began, to her distress, by spewing out, as well as I could remember it, an analysis of a classical Chomsky-type ambiguous sentence. The whole town was populated by old men and women. We're now dealing with a third kind of ambiguity, I told her, neither phonological nor syntactic, but both, a new semantic ambiguity. I gave her a hasty rundown on why that sentence is ambiguous, without diagrams, of course, uh, and unfortunately, because this is where Chomsky's tree diagrams are really valuable. The whole town was populated by old men and women is an ambiguous sentence because it has two different deep structures. The first would show us one meaning, that the town was populated by old men and old women, possibly because all the young people had gone off to the big city, leaving only the old folks behind. But there is a second meaning arising from the other deep structure. And based on the idea, possibly, that all the young men had gone off to war, leaving behind old men and women of all ages. You see the difference. It's a whole other situation. Now, through our well-known processes of transformation, mainly deletions, those two deep structures have been combined and condensed into the one ambiguous phrase, old men and women. And that's a famous example, as you must know, of the figure of speech known as zygma, meaning two nouns yoked to one adjective, as the nouns men and women are both yoked to the single adjective old. There's a fascinating and very helpful musical analogy to be made here which I naturally couldn't demonstrate to my charming young inquisitor in Harvard Yard, stuck as we were in the middle of Harvard Yard. But I can demonstrate it for you. Think of this famous passage in Stravinsky's Petrushka. You all know that. Now, recalling our last lecture, just think of all that melodic material on top as a series of nouns. That's one, here's another. Here's another. Another noun. So on. Now think of the harmonic support underneath as a verbal adjective. You remember those correlations we made? Never changing. And what have we got? A zygma with the same unchanging adjective modifying all those different nouns. So on. But back in Harvard Yard, my blonde inquisitor was getting impatient. 
Zugma schmugma, she said. Get to the point. What has all this got to do with poetry? Patience, I said, I'm just coming to the point. The big leap. By reapplying the transformational rule of deletion to that sentence, or prose surface structure as it's called, the whole town was populated by old men and women, we can turn an already ambiguous sentence into an even more ambiguous one, a super surface structure. The whole town was old men and women. The whole town was old men and women. And that, for better or worse, is a line of poetry. The whole town was old men and women, a poetic statement. In fact, old men and women is all by itself a poetic phrase, resulting from the previous deletion of one old from the prosy phrase old men and old women. And now we've also deleted populated by, making it even more poetic because more ambiguous. It's now supercharged with meanings and therefore poetry. Maybe, said my pretty inquisitor, maybe it's poetry, but can you prove it? No, I can't. I can't prove anything. I could possibly explain it, again, by borrowing methodology from linguistics. A linguist would say, look, when you're confronted by a sentence like that one, the whole town was old men and women, which is syntactically correct, but semantically incorrect, since a town is a place and men and women are people, and a place can't be people. So where does the is come in? When you're confronted by a sentence like that, your mind automatically goes through a series of decision-making steps. First, it seeks some grammatical justification of that semantic conflict, and finding none can then decide one of two things, to reject it as illogical, impermissible speech, or to find another level on which it may be acceptable, a poetic level. In other words, something in the mind intuits a metaphorical meaning and then can accept the semantic ambiguity on that level. Now, did that word metaphorical register with you? I hope so, because metaphor is our key to understanding. In fact, I just used a metaphor. I said metaphor is a key. In other words, I've made an equation between a figurative way of speaking called a metaphor and a small metal object called a key. I have said, in effect, this equals that, where this and that belong to two completely different and incompatible orders, exactly like the town and its inhabitants of old men and women. In other words, I've broken a semantic rule. But it's precisely this linguistic misdemeanor, breaking the rules, by which metaphor is achieved. Juliet is the sun, a famous classic example of this is that, equating two incompatible orders, one human and the other sidereal. Juliet is a human organism. The sun is a star. How do they get to be equal? How indeed, said my pretty new friend. Well, I replied, Chomsky would say that there are certain syntactic rules associated with lexical meanings. That is, we all possess a learned lexicon that has its own rules and classifications. Our mental dictionary in English, for instance, permits us to say such things as Trilling lectured on sincerity, which he did in the last Norton lecture, but forbids us to say sincerity lectured on trilling. There are certain things we know about the lexical items sincerity and lecture on that prevent our saying that sincerity lectures on anything or anyone. Now, of course, Chomsky is not interested in, he may be interested, but he's not concerned with poetry. His inquiry is into normal human speech. And Juliet is the sun is abnormal human speech. It is, so to speak, illogical. But we can find the logic in it, the poetic logic, by using, ironically enough, Chomsky's own transformational principles. What if we were to construct a logical progression that would normalize Shakespeare's metaphor? We could say, there is a human being called Juliet. There is a star called the sun. The human being called Juliet is radiant. A star called the sun is radiant. Hence, the human being called Juliet is like a star called the sun in respect to radiance. Perfectly logical. Now come the transformations, which are all deletions, as you can imagine. 
That is, we delete all those logical but unnecessary steps that are built into the deep structure of any comparison and wind up with our conclusive simile, Juliet is like the sun, which is true in one respect, that they are both radiant. We then make the final supreme deletion of the word like, and behold, our simile is transformed into a metaphor. Juliet is the sun. This is that. Now, of course, that last metaphorical leap makes it false logic, as in that invalid syllogism they always throw at you in elementary logic courses. My dog is brown, your dog is brown, hence my dog is your dog. Wrong. My dog is like your dog in terms of brownness and only of brownness. Right, but it's not poetry. It's not a metaphor. It's only a simile belonging to the realm of literal discourse. Whereas the false logical version, my dog is your dog, has its own inner metaphorical logic. Are you beginning to see what I mean? And there, in a nutshell, is the difference between art and what we loosely call reality or real life. What must be clear by now is that a metaphor or any comparative statement, even a simile, must function in terms of the two compared items being related to a third item, which is common to both. That is, we are comparing A and B, whether they are my dog and your dog, or Juliet and the sun, A and B, both of which must relate to a third factor, X, which is abstractable from both. If A is Juliet and B is the sun, then X is radiance, or any number of other things, but let's say radiance, and A is like X, and B is like X, therefore A is like B. Juliet is like the sun. We then delete the like, the supreme deletion, and now Juliet is the sun. And what a deletion is there. Of such transformations are metaphors made, and of such metaphors is beauty born. Terrific, said my blonde inquisitor. I think I understand you. What I don't understand is how you relate all this stuff to music. You will, I said, come to the next lecture. Well, this is it, and I hope she's here, because we've just reached the crucial point. You remember I spoke of the mind having to go through a series of decision-making steps when confronted by a semantic incongruity, <laughs> first seeking justification, and then either rejecting it or accepting it on a poetic level. Well, add to that a whole other series of steps these very ones we've been describing, namely the finding of an X factor to which A and B can both relate. My dog is your dog because they're both brown. But that can't be, says the mind. Oh, I see, it can be in a poetic sense. That's the process. Now, all of that complex mental process takes place in a millisecond, a flash of time. Such is the wonder of our cerebral computer. But the moment we come to deal with musical metaphor, even that millisecond is eliminated because we don't have to deal with the problems of A and B being incompatible. And why not? Because the A's and B's of music are not burdened by literal semantic weights like my dog or your dog or Juliet. If this is A and this is B, we instantly perceive the musical transformation with no time or effort needed to explain that relationship in terms of semantic meaning. The only time required is the time it takes to play it. In fact, when you think of the number of transformations taking place in the short space of those few bars of Brahms, it becomes almost incredible that it can all be instantaneously perceived. What we've called A in itself involves a transformation. The descending major third transformed to its exact inversion and ascending minor sixth. So A already contains a metaphor, and so does B. You see? But in addition to that, B is a metaphor of A through the comparative transformation of A, which is transformed by lowering it one degree of the scale. 
And add to that the harmonic metaphor accompanying the melodic one. The A progression is tonic subdominant. And the B progression is dominant tonic. A beautiful parallelism and a shining case of this is that. So in music as well as in poetry, the A and B of a metaphor must also both relate to some X factor, not radiance or brownness, but a common factor such as the rhythm, or those harmonic progressions, one, four, five, one. You see, there is still that triangular formation of A, B, and X to be reckoned with. And yet, with all this to be perceived, all these metaphors within metaphors, we still don't require even that one millisecond before perceiving it. There's no need to go through that can't be, oh, I see it can be in a poetic sense, because the music already exists in a poetic sense. It's all art from the first note. And there, Blondie, you have your introduction to musical semantics. But what is musical semantics as related to, but opposed to, verbal semantics? All right, first let's look briefly at the verbal side. I think most linguists will agree that semantics, uh, which is the study of pure meaning, has always been the weakest of the three linguistic departments because it's the least studied. And that's because it's the hardest to render in truly scientific fashion. As a result, linguists have usually left semantic considerations to other disciplines like uh, philology, etymology, lexicography, aesthetics, or literary criticism. And this fact has spawned some of the sharpest criticisms of Chomsky, mostly by his own disciples, the young Turks, and many of whom are now busily engaged in an effort to evolve a theory of semantic structures which can be as scientifically sound as the syntactic one. In fact, Chomsky himself is said to be working in this area, trying to head off the Young Turks at the pass. But it's not easy, especially for us old Turks. You recall our experiment in monogenesis from the first lecture? How we prolonged the ictus of the proto-syllable ma and heightened it into a musical tone? Ma! Well, that was a fairly pure scientific attempt, but not so pure that we could for one second ignore the semantic resonance of motherhood in that one syllable, ma. Nor could we avoid amorous inferences in the syntactic entanglements of Jack and Jill during our last lecture. No more than Chomsky himself can avoid them when he speaks of Harry and John and golf and persuasion. It's a semantic trap that no linguist can totally avoid. And in the same way, as we've been discussing the musical equivalence of these linguistic areas, we too have been semantically entrapped. Willy-nilly, we've been dealing with semantics all along. In the first lecture on phonology, we dealt with the ordering of phonemic elements out of the harmonic series so as to produce meaningful tonal relationships. Meaningful. And in the second lecture on syntax, we were dealing with the ordering of those tonal relationships so as to produce meaningful structures. So that now when we come to consider musical semantics in general, what meanings are there left to deal with? Well, obviously, the musical meanings that result from the combination of both, of what we might call phonosemantics plus morphosemantics, meanings derived by the various transformational procedures with which we've been playing. Playing, that's the word that leapt out, and precisely the word I want to use. It sounds frivolous, I know, but it is, on the contrary, essentially related to our semantic thinking. Play is the very stuff and activity of music. We play music on our instruments just as the composer plays with notes in the act of inventing it. He juggles sound formations. He toys with dynamics. He glides and skips and somersaults through rhythms and colors. In short, he indulges in what Stravinsky called le jeu de notes the game of notes, a striking concept of what music is. And why not? All music, even the most serious, thrives on its puns and anagrams. 
Where would Richard Strauss be without his musical puns? Or Bach and Beethoven without their musical anagrams? One can almost think of a whole given piece of music as a continuing game of anagrams in which there are, as it were, 12 letters, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, which can be juggled and rejuggled. And the constant rearrangement and transformation of these letters is made particularly rich by the combined possibilities of horizontal and vertical structures, melodic, harmonic, and contrapuntal anagrams, which of course language cannot do, even with its 26 letters. And music is further enriched by the extension of these possibilities to near infinity through the extraordinary variety of high and low registers and durations, dynamics, meters, rhythms, tempi, colorations. It's as if all music were one super game of sonic anagrams. But does this Stravinskyan game concept of music really cover the subject? A game may serve a number of purposes. To release energy, to exercise the mind or body, to while away the time. A game may also have more affective functions, to compete, to show off, or to establish a shared intimacy with the opponent. Now, all these may well be functions of music, too, and frequently are. But nobody's going to assert that music stops there. There's got to be more to it than those merely pleasurable functions, even if they do go so far as to constitute a refreshment of the spirit. Music does more than that, says more, means more. Means, there's the problem. Means what? Sad, glad, moonlight sonata, revolutionary etude, by units of information, significational sensory effects, cybernetic feedback. What do you mean, mean? Well, the very first Young People's Program I ever gave on television about 15 years ago was entitled, What Does Music Mean? And here I am still asking that question, and my answers haven't changed very much, but I think I can now present a more mature formulation of them particularly since I have a more mature audience to tell it to, as concisely as possible, this is it. Music has intrinsic meanings of its own, which are not to be confused with specific feelings or moods, and certainly not with pictorial impressions or stories. These intrinsic meanings are generated by a constant stream of metaphors which are all forms of poetic transformations. And this is our thesis. I believe that this thesis can be demonstrated, and in fact has already been partly demonstrated, even if not scientifically proved. And the reason for that is probably the very unscientific word metaphor, which I've already been using in a most metaphorical way, and will no doubt continue so to do. But I should clarify this broad use of the term, at least to the extent that we can distinguish one use from another. There are three specific ways in which I want to use the term metaphor. First, those intrinsic musical metaphors I've already mentioned, metaphors of a purely musical order, operating rather like those puns and anagram games we were speaking of. Uh, all these metaphors derive from transformations of musical material, those very Chomskyan transformations we investigated last week. By transforming any musical material from one state to another, as I showed earlier with the Brahms, we automatically arrive at the test equation of any metaphor, namely, this is that. Juliet is the sun. Secondly, we must define extrinsic metaphors by which musical meanings are related to non-musical meanings. In other words, certain semantic meanings belonging to the so-called real world, the world out there, the non-musical world, are assigned to musical art in terms of literal semantic values, namely extra-musical ones. This form of this equals that is typified in Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, which we'll be hearing after the 
pause after the break, intermission, in which certain notes are meant to be associated in the listener's mind, meant, mind you, to be associated in the listener's mind with certain images like merry peasants, brooks, and birds. In other words, these notes equal those birds. Again, this equals that in another form. And finally, we must think of metaphor in an analogical way as we compare those intrinsic musical metaphors, those pure ones, with their counterparts in speech, strictly verbal ones. And this comparison is in itself a metaphorical operation. It says this musical transformation is like that verbal one. This is like that. Delete like, and you've got the metaphor. Now, having defined my usages of metaphor, I suppose I am now committed to plunging into that eternal aesthetic debate. And it's a debate I don't particularly wish to prolong. So many excellent and sensitive minds have wrestled with this problem of the meaning of music. To say nothing of the meaning of meaning. Santayana and Croce, Prol and Pratt, I.A. Richards and Bergson, Beardsley, Birkhoff, Babbitt, Suzanne Langer, and Stravinsky himself. And one thing they have always agreed on, in one way or another, is that musical meaning does exist, whether rational or affective or both. As hard as they've all tried to be logical, to avoid romantic generalizing or philosophical maundering, they have all had to bow eventually to some nagging truth which insists that those innocent F sharps and B flats, however sportively juggled or played with, do emerge from a composer's mind meaning something, nay, expressing something, and expressing what may otherwise be inexpressible. But wait a minute, isn't there a difference between meaning and expressing? There is, if we are to be at all accurate. When a piece of music means something to me, it's a meaning conveyed by the sounding notes themselves, what Hans Lick called sonorous forms in motion. It's a wonderful phrase. And I can report those feelings of mine back to you precisely in terms of those forms. But when music expresses something to me, it is something I am feeling. And the same is true of you and of every listener. We feel passion. We feel glory. We feel mystery. We feel something. And here we're in trouble because we cannot report our precise feelings in scientific terms. We can report them only subjectively. For me, the end of Sibelius' Second Symphony may be orange colors. For you, it may be a sunrise. For you, it may be a glorious sunset. For somebody else, it may be a triumphant battle. There, it's endless, subjectively. If we could collect sample feelings from a concert audience, lay them slide by slide on a lab table, compare them and find them consistent, then we'd know something. Then science would smile on our endeavors. But alas, feelings, whatever they are, slither past the scientific laboratory, and we are left asking such pseudo-scientific questions as where does affect come into all this? Is it those intrinsic musical meanings that move us so deeply? Or is there a transference of affect via the notes from the composer to the performer to the listener? Are we feeling what Beethoven supposedly felt when he wrote these notes? Now, I know what I'm feeling. I'm feeling, please, please. I implore you, I'll do anything if... And comes the reply, yes, but only on certain conditions. Please, I said, pretty please. <laughs> if you don't, on the other hand, if you do, same answer comes again, and so on, through new methods of pleading. Coy and wheedling. 
and so on, all through the movement. I could go through the whole thing with tears and passion and temper and bribery, and I could make up a whole drama of pleading and refusal, nothing specific, you understand, but a drama nonetheless, ending up with a firm agreement with the conditions accepted and everything settled. <laughs> but did Beethoven feel all that? Or even anything like it? Did I just make up those feelings out of the blue? Or are they in some way, to some degree, related to Beethoven's feelings which have been transferred to me through his notes? Of course, we'll never know. We can't call him up. But the probability is that both are true. And if so, we have just revealed a major ambiguity, a beautiful new semantic ambiguity to add to our fast-growing list. But whichever is true, the basic point remains. Music does possess the power of expressivity. And the human being does innately possess the capacity to respond to it. Everyone agrees on that in one way or another. Even William James, who regarded our reaction to music as nothing but a nervous tick. Where they disagree is in making the distinction between what music expresses and how it expresses it. The what is very hard to pin down, as we've seen. But the how, we do know about, and that's metaphor. In any sense in which music can be considered a language, and there are some senses in which it cannot be considered a language, but in the sense in which it can be, it is a totally metaphorical language. Consider the etymology of the word metaphor, meta, beyond, and ferein to carry, carrying meaning beyond the literal, the tangible, beyond the grossly semantic, to the self-contained ding an sich of musical meaning. Metaphor is the generator, the power plant of music, just as it is of poetry. Aristotle puts metaphor midway between the unintelligible and the commonplace. It's a marvelous remark. It is metaphor, he says, which most produces knowledge. The artist cannot help but agree, nor can the lover of art. And Quintilian says it even more strikingly. He says that metaphor accomplishes the supremely difficult task of providing a name for everything. And by everything, he obviously meant our interior lives, the things that can't be named otherwise, our psychic landscapes and actions. And it is thus that poetry and music, but especially music, through its specific and far-reaching metaphorical powers, can and does name the unnameable and communicate the unknowable. Now, if we accept this general idea of music as a meta-language, and I can see no reason why we shouldn't, and if we relate it back to our investigation of transformational linguistics, then a remarkable and exciting hypothesis suddenly presents itself. Is it not conceivable that there exists an innate universal grammar of musical metaphor? Think of it. Just let your minds reprise what has led up to this point. The original idea of universality, that all grammars evolve from basically similar principles, that out of these formal universals arise cognate deep structures within the various particular languages, that via transformational paths these deep structures then rise to the surface as normal speech in various languages, and that via a further transformational leap those surface structures in turn re-evolve into what we call poetry. Now given this chain of ideas, hasn't everything we've been saying for three weeks led us inexorably to the hypothesis that all transformational processes ultimately yield metaphoric results? That is, if you recall our parallel ladder charts from the syntax lecture, these processes can produce such results in language, but must produce them in music. In other words, don't all metaphors, verbal or musical, derive from transformational processes? I suggest that the answer is an overwhelming yes. In our last lecture, 
We saw how some of these transformational processes might operate analogously in Shakespeare and Mozart. Remember? It was a sort of game. That's really what we musicians do best, play games. And I now propose to continue playing that game in a more detailed way to find musical equivalents for smaller, more specific metaphorical operations in language, namely simple figures of speech, such as antithesis, alliteration, and so on. And here my pretty young inquisitor might well interrupt again and say, how can you include simple figures of speech in the category of metaphor? Aren't they simply rhetorical devices, stylistic embellishments of language? Well, yes, they are. But they are also metaphors in miniature to the extent that in every case they present A's and B's which are equated with each other through a common relationship with a third factor, X. Only the X factor, in the case of figures of speech, is non-semantic. It's not radiance or brownness but rather an abstract principle of design. And therefore, it's a true X factor, a symbol in the algebraic sense of X. For example, what is the X factor in the case of antithesis? Like this one from the Mikado. See how the fates, their gifts a lot. You know that one? A is happy, B is not. A opposed to B. Now, what is the X factor? The principle of contrast the design of oppositions. Here's A, here's B, here's the principle of the design. There's the triangle. Now, we all recognize antithesis when we read a biblical psalm. For instance, the dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence, but we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forever. Antithesis, A versus B, they versus we. But in these lines, we recognize much more than a figure of speech, because through that figure of speech, we perceive a whole poetic meaning. Why set up the dead at all in opposition to us, the living? Isn't it enough to say, we will bless the Lord? It's a perfectly good psalm idea. No, it's not enough, not for making this particular poetic statement. These verses are a microcosm, a poetic essence of the entire psalm which is all established on antithesis, beginning not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to thy name give glory, and continuing that antithetical design by setting up the polar extremes of idols, which are of silver and gold, eyes have they, but they see not, and so on. And on the other hand, but our God is in the heavens, which in turn leads to further antitheses, <coughs> until we are finally ready to understand those last lines distinguishing between the dead who praise not and us who do. We now perceive through that continuing antithesis that by the dead, the psalmist is speaking metaphorically of the idolatrous nations who worship the work of their own hands. Now that's an example of how a simple figure of speech can be extended to permeate and qualify a whole poetic structure. Now, can this happen also in music? It can, and it does. There are millions of examples. I'll pounce on one at random. Uh, Mozart's great C minor piano sonata, which presents itself at the very outset in a striking antithesis. Now, I take it the antithesis is perfectly clear to you. There's A which is countered by B. But you may argue, yes, maybe, but is it really the equivalent of verbal antithesis, of a heavenly god versus a man-made idol, a clear, tangible opposition? Isn't the Mozart rather an example of contrast than of antithesis? Yes, it does involve contrast, loud ver versus soft, rising intervals, versus falling ones, rough hammer blows versus tender entreaty, and so on. It is not a literary figure of speech, as in the psalm, but it is a figure of musical speech. And because of the abstract nature of music, the pure non-representational nature of music, such a figure can affect us with even greater directness and force 
than a verbal one. And again, as in the psalm, but even more than in the psalm, this figure of Mozart's musical speech is then extended to condition and characterize the whole poetic structure. Look at this marvel. That, that opening statement in itself so abundant in its antithetical meanings <laughs> is immediately answered by a counterstatement. Now this is not only a thematic answer to the first statement, but a harmonic opposition to it, since the first one proceeded from the tonic to the dominant. There's the tonic and proceeded to the dominant, right? While the counterstatement does the opposite, starting with the dominant, up with the tonic. And so we now have not one, but two antitheses, two of equal length conjoined to form yet a third, twice the length of either. And we could go on through the whole movement finding constant new sets of antitheses, but enough. I've taken more time than I meant to with this one figure of speech, antithesis, but it's awfully easy to be seduced by Mozart's music, and I did want you to understand what I meant by such a figurative device as antithesis becoming a basic structural principle, the metaphoric fountainhead, so to speak, of this whole Mozart sonata. But antithesis itself is founded on an even more basic structural principle, that of repetition. Where would those biblical or Mozartian antitheses be without the previous assumption of repetition which can then be varied by applying to it the principle of opposition. Indeed, all figures of speech and all metaphors in speech and music alike depend ultimately on repetition, which is then subjected to variation or, as the linguists say, transformation. I can't stress this point strongly enough. In fact, it has been authoritatively suggested that the main reason a serious theory of musical syntax has been so slow to develop is the refusal of musical theorists to recognize repetition as the key factor. I think it was uh, Nicolas Rivet, who was a great musicologist as well as a linguist, who proposed this argument. And his argument grows out of a proposition by Roman Jakobsen, a great linguistic thinker and one of Chomsky's most influential teachers. And Jakobsen, speaking of poetry, said, and I've reduced this quote, Jakobsen said, it is only by the regular reiteration of equivalent units that poetry provides an experience of time comparable to that of musical time. Unquote. Now that would seem a gross oversimplification especially if he is referring to the regular reiteration of metrical units. Da-da, 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 hardly produces poetry. That's more like doggerel. But the moment we apply to that mechanical regularity the processes of transformation and variation, then we immediately see what he's getting at, and we can extend Jakobsen's reiterative principle to include all facets of poetic diction, not only meter. For example, the repetition of elementary sounds, vowels, consonants, phonemes, which gives us the whole range of poetic assonance, from the simple alliteration of Shakespeare's full fathom five to the complex and mysterious resonances of Milton in Paradise Lost, fragrant the fertile earth after soft showers, or of Gerard Manley Hopkins' sonorous hymn of praise for dappled things, the skies of couple color as a brinded cow, to say nothing of the fascinating auditory correlatives that resonate in the poetry of Dylan Thomas, and green and golden I was huntsman and herdsman, or the so-called prose of James Joyce, which is really poetry, beside the rivering waters of the hithering, th hither and thithering, I can never say that word, the hither and thithering waters of night. And even more, we can see poetry born of the repetition of actual words, not just sounds, but whole words. Only think of the five consecutive nevers uttered by King Lear in his death scene. 
Never, 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 ever. We can expand the idea further to include the repetition of whole images, as in T.S. Eliot's quartets, or even the repetition of whole lines, a device so commonly found in the Bible, or in poetic drama, Brutus is an honorable man, over and over again. Not to mention Gertrude Stein, who made a whole career out of repetition. <laughs> But the point must be clear by now that it is repetition, modified in one way or another, that gives poetry its musical qualities. Because repetition is so essential to music itself. And that's true of all metaphorical phenomena down to the last little figure of speech. Take alliteration, perhaps the simplest of all. Shelley writes, wild west wind. All right. Back to our game. Where is such alliteration to be found in music? What is the equivalent of Wild West Wind? Well, you find it everywhere in uh, Beethoven's Eighth. In Schubert's Rosamunda. All alliteration of the uh, Shostakovich Fifth Symphony. César Franck Symphony. And uh, even in William Tell. But that's all too easy. The game becomes really pro when we move from identical initial notes to identical initial groups of notes. And here the term alliteration is not enough. It becomes the far grander term, anaphora, which in rhetorical circles names the device of beginning lines or stanzas with identical words or phrases, such as Tennyson's famous sequence, ring out wild bells to the wild sky, ring out the old, ring in the new, or ring out the grief that saps the mind, so on. Or one can find anaphora in almost any religious litany, such as the Beatitudes, as well as almost anywhere in Isaiah. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Woe unto them. And lo, we find anaphora in Mahler's Fifth Symphony. <laughs> anaphora. Or in Beethoven's Second, for that matter. But basta anaphora. On to another. What do you suppose is the rhetorical figure operating in this most unrhetorical Schubert melody? Anybody got any ideas? It is a device that bears the proud name chiasmus, a fancy word that means simply reversing the order of elements midway through a statement. What's Hecuba to him, or he to Hecuba? Or John Kennedy's, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. A, B, B, A. Notice again how this figure is based on repetition, as they all are. Repetition subjected to reversal. A, B, B, A. And Schubert, blissfully unaware of chiasmus, just went ahead and created one. A, B, B, A. Now that's so obviously dependent on repetition, it barely needs mentioning. What's important is the variation of those A's and B's, which has transformed them into a musical metaphor. And the X factor here is clearly the symmetrical design itself, A, B, B, A. I was astonished one day uh, suddenly to discover a huge chiasmus just squatting there <laughs> in, uh, in so unpretentious a piece as Chabrier's Rhapsody España. Do you know the Rhapsody España? Mm. Now this one, this chiasmus, involves two whole different consecutive tunes, not just bars, tunes one chiastic version of the other. The first one goes, this is the A. B. 
Then it, they're both repeated. Here's A again. B. And then the chiasmus breaks open. B. A. B. B. A. So on. A perfect reversal. Incredible, I find it, and much more than just an amusing game, although I'm tempted to go on playing it, but it's, uh, it's showing off after all. But uh, I have found ropalisms in Beethoven's First Symphony and polysyndetons in Petrushka and assyndeton in Bruckner, uh, but fun is fun. What's seriously striking about all this is that all these figures of speech, all these poetic and or rhetorical devices, are transformations in our old familiar Chomskyan sense. And as we know, all musical transformations lead to metaphorical results. So a piece of music is a constant metamorphosis of given material involving such transformational devices as inversion, augmentation, retrograde, diminution, modulation, the opposition of consonance and dissonance, the various forms of imitation like canon and fugue, the varieties of rhythm and meter, harmonic progressions, coloristic dynamic changes, plus the infinite interrelations of all these with one another. These are the meanings of music. And that's as close as I can come to a definition of musical semantics. Now, after a brief pause, we're going to see and hear a filmed performance of Beethoven's Symphony No. 6 in F. Why this particular symphony in this particular lecture, Beethoven's Sixth, would seem to be the least likely piece on earth to illustrate purely musical meanings, which is, after all, what we've been talking about, since it's encumbered from start to finish with non-musical meanings. For openers, it bears the subtitle pastoral, which instantly places the work in an area of extra musical meaning, namely the area of the countryside. And as if that weren't enough, each of its five movements bears its own subtitle, the awakening of cheerful feelings on arriving in the country. That's number one. Seen by the brook, second movement, and happy gathering of the peasant folk, the storm, Number four, and finally, a shepherd's song of joy and thankfulness after the storm. Now, that alone would be enough to distract any listener's attention from such things as inversions and subdominance to say nothing of deletions and permutations. But no, Beethoven goes even further and injects actual onomatopoetic references to country life, bird calls and village bands, lightning and thunder and shepherd's pipes. It's as close to program music as Beethoven ever came. So why the pastoral on this lecture, where we're concerned not with the birds and the bees, but uh, with the Fs and the Cs? It took me a week to think that one up. <laughs> the notes, uh, the Fs and the Cs, the notes themselves, which form the intrinsic metaphors of music. Metaphors that evolve out of syntactic and phonological transformations. And that's precisely the reason I've chosen it, to clarify and distinguish between one kind of metaphor and another, between the intrinsic and the extrinsic, the musical and the verbal. I'll try to help you, before we hear it somewhat, at the piano, and then we can go on playing our game to determine whether it's possible for us to listen to this piece as pure music, not as a pastoral symphony, but rather purely as Beethoven Symphony No. 6 in F major, Opus 68. Do you think it's possible? That's what we're going to find out after this pause. Uh, where were we? Oh, yes, we had just come face to face with a most intriguing question. Is it possible to hear Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony as pure music 
divorced from all its extrinsic non-musical metaphors. Well, it should be possible since Beethoven himself said that all those subtitles and cuckoo calls and thunderclaps were to be taken only as suggestion, not as tone painting, to use his own words, but as empfindungen, feelings, and therefore not too literally. But still, those extra musical references are there. Beethoven put them there with his own hand. He wrote them into the score. It's not easy to ignore them. And what they do, actually, is to form a kind of visual curtain of non-musical ideas, a semi-transparent curtain, so to speak, that interposes itself between the listener and the music per se. And what I propose to do is to change the lighting on that curtain, using a light strong enough to render it wholly transparent, and to turn it into a scrim, as they say in the theater, through which we can look directly into the music in all its intrinsic meanings, cleanly, freed from the bondage of so-called music appreciation, or of flowery program notes, or of those Disney nymphs and centaurs which have somehow also gotten painted onto our scrim. Away with all that, I am presenting you with a challenge to rid your minds of all non-musical notions, all birds and brooks and rustic pleasures, and to concentrate only on the music in all its own metaphorical pleasures. I want you to hear it as if for the first time. Let's begin at the beginning, in the first four bars. Now those four bars are the material out of which this whole first movement is going to grow. And it's not just the main material, but the only material. Every bar and phrase to come, and I mean everyone without exception, will be some kind of transformation, some metaphorical rendering of the elements present in those four little bars. Now what are those elements? Well, on the face of it, they seem to be a blithe little tune in F major ending on the dominant with a pause, or as we say, a fermata. But is that really all? Not at all. Just look at the bass line, which you'd hardly notice as a line, but it is. The tonic F to the dominant C. And this FC, or Fa Do, turns out to be the real motto of the whole movement, and by extension, the whole symphony. It's as much the motto of the sixth symphony as that is the motto of the fifth. And it will keep reappearing over and over in the bass and up on top or hidden in between or transposed or transformed or speeded up or whatever. But a constant running metaphor throughout like the figure in the carpet in Henry James' great story. The whole piece is like an essay on the subject of fa do. And I'm sure you'll hear that very clearly when the symphony's played. But what of the more obvious melodic material, the tune on the top? Now what Beethoven does with that, in true Beethoven style, is immediately to develop it, to vary it, to transform it. Now right away we can spot one obvious transformation what was this has now become this. And so we already have a metaphor. This is that in disguise. A equals B. What went down now goes up. So B is A in new clothing. And the common X factor is, of course, the rhythm. Dum -ta -ga -dum -dum. Now that's an elementary permutation, simple inversion as it's called. But there's a far subtler transformation involved here, namely a linguistic deletion of the kind we found last time in the Mozart symphony. Look, here again is the opening four bar phrase ending in the dominant. Now according to the symmetrical demands of the deep structure, there should follow a complementary four-bar phrase ending in the tonic. How dull! 
The symphony has died a morning. Imagine then trying to go on with the next section. Sheer agony. And the remedy, of course, is deletion. Just lose that second complementary phrase and eliminate the agony. The opening material is now free to develop. But to develop how? Like this. And repeat. Then new material. Repeat. Repeat, repeat. How many times have I repeated the word repeat in this short development? I lost count. Oh, what is all this repetition business? Here we were just a moment ago shouting praises for deletion, for the omission of repeats. And that was our leading metaphor in the pastoral. And now we suddenly find Beethoven repeating as if obsessed. What is this new paradox? It's not a paradox at all. It needs only a few words of clarification. First of all, none of those repeats I just played is an exact or literal repeat. Each one contains some variation or other, a slight elaboration or an added voice or a structural ambiguity or a change in the dynamics of loud and soft or something. And secondly, what is variation anyway? It's always, in one way or another, a manifestation of that mighty dramatic principle known as the violation of expectation. I'm sure you've all studied that in freshman English. And what is expected is, of course, repetition in this case, in the form of an answer or a counterstatement or whatever. And when those are violated, you've got a variation. The violation is the variation. In other words, variation cannot exist without the previously assumed idea of repetition, which explains the deletion we heard at the beginning of the symphony just now. What was deleted was the unconscious expectation of a symmetrical counterpart to the first four-bar phrase. And that deletion is in itself a kind of, viol of variation. Do you see what I mean? It's the conspicuous absence of the expected repetition which makes that particular musical surface structure what it is. So now see if you can follow this, because this is the topper, that the idea of repetition is inherent in music even when the repetition itself is not there at all. In other words, the repetitive principle lies at the very source of musical art, just as it does in poetry, as we learned from Jakobson's reiterative principle. Now we have an insight into repetitive functions that enables us to view this pastoral symphony, the, sorry, the sixth symphony in F. Uh, we've got to be careful about this metaphorical mix-up. Uh, the sixth symphony, and to view all that Beethovenian repeating with new comprehension and to see exactly how he transforms garden variety repetition into metaphor. In other words, how he prevents garden variety repetition from becoming garden variety boredom by the magic of transformations. Uh, in the interest of clarity, let's reduce that opening melodic material to its component parts. Bar one, which we'll call the head of the theme. Then bar two, this jaunty rhythmic motive, which let's call the, well, Let's call it the jaunty motive. And finally, bars three and four, which being all scale-wise, can be called the scale-wise motive. Now, do you remember how Beethoven began at this point to develop that material in what seemed to be mere repetition of the thematic head and the jaunty motive? And you remember that we immediately found a transformation of that jaunty motive, which was originally into this, a simple figure of musical speech called inversion. Just as the phrase, roses are red, can be inverted to red are roses, resulting in a more poetic structure. But there's also another figure of speech at work here called fragmentation, which transforms the repetition even further. You see, these two developmental bars are split up and shared by two different voices. 
That is, we hear the second violins play the head motive, and the first violins answer with the already transformed jaunty motive. And that makes it a double transformation. But wait, Beethoven carries the fragmentation even further. The two parts of this split up are not just a neat division into head motive and jaunty motive. That would be much too simple-minded for Beethoven. What actually happens is that the second violins play the head plus the first note of the jaunty, whereupon the first violins respond with the remainder, namely the jaunty minus its first note. Now this is no mere whim of Beethoven's. It exemplifies that special molecular growth process of his, the incredibly ongoing quality of his music, whereby motives or parts of motives can become attached or detached in infinite numbers of ways by constant repositioning, conjoining, and embedding. And this process is so intense and diversified that even so apparently destructive an activity as fragmentation contributes profusely to the growth of this living organism. Now, obviously, the study of these two little bars is fascinating and endless, so we have to get on to the next two bars, which are an almost literal repeat of what we just examined. But only almost literal. Did you notice the two added notes in the first violin part? In other words, the first time we heard now this time, the, on the repeat, we hear just enough elaboration to avoid a strictly literal repeat. And that transformation is also a nameable figure of speech, oxesis, an increase in density. But why were just those two notes added, that B flat and that G? Because they form an interval of the third, a descending interval which mirrors the rising interval of the third in the head motive which the second violins are playing. Do you hear that ascending third, rising, the B flat rising to D? Well, the oxesis is simply the addition, the addition of its descending counterpart in the upper voice, B flat falling to G, and a metaphor has been created between this ascending third and this descending third. And so we now have You see it? You hear it? Okay, inversion, fragmentation, oxesis. That's a lot of transformation going on in the short space of four little bars, especially when you know that they're really only two bars almost literally repeated. But the big news is that we still haven't uncovered the most striking and beautiful metaphor of all in these same four bars, and that's to be found in the viola part. Did you know that under all that figurative motion and the violins, the violas are playing this tune? Had you heard that? Probably not, unless you're an experienced listener. Such inner voices are the hardest to perceive, sandwiched in as they are between the sky above and the mud below. But now that you have perceived it, and the fine little line it is, too. Now, are you going to ask what's it doing there, where it came from, or do you sense something inherently relevant about it, a familiar resonance, a family resemblance? If you do, then you have perceived the metaphor, whether you can explain it or not. But that's not your job, it's my job. So I'll explain it. Okay. This metaphor arises out of three different and simultaneous transformations. Inversion, retrograde, and augmentation. Sorry about those long official words. They're really very simple to understand. Inversion we already know about. And in this case, what is being inverted is that very moment of fragmentary conjoining we just saw when the head motive latches on to the first note of the jaunty motive, right? You can see and hear those intervals of the ascending third followed by the descending second, all conjoined together. 
Now our metaphorical viola line simply inverts these intervals to a descending third followed by an ascending second. And this metaphor is further enhanced by the fact that its intervals, a third followed by a second, are the direct reversal of the head motive itself, whose intervals are a second followed by a third. Hence the term retrograde, or going backwards. And as for augmentation, we simply mean an increase of note length. In other words, the viola tune proceeds in quarter notes, whereas the motives from which it derives move in eighth notes twice as fast. So thus, the viola tune is twice as slow, its notes augmented to double duration. And so through these three devices, this triple transformation, a rich metaphor is created, a particularly strong example of this is that. It's practically these are those. If you think of the viola line as the this, and the violin music on top of it as the that. You can then hear them together and the whole complex metaphorical structure will come clear. You hear what goes on in those four bars? It's an unbelievable model of the human brain, the genius human brain, in action. And as such, it's a model of how we think. It's the clearest linguistic model you can possibly find. You see, that's the unique miracle of music, that it enables us to perceive this and that simultaneously, which no other art can do. And there can be no stronger or richer presentation of metaphor. But in the ensuing four bars, we discover a new musical wonder, a metaphor of a metaphor. Now, this new material is not new material at all, but again, a transformation by inversion of that same viola line we were just listening to, which, as you know, went. A Beethoven just turns those three notes upside down, and lo, there is his new material. And of course, therein lies the secret of the inevitability one always feels in Beethoven's music. It's a constant metaphorical growth, self-generating, always on its own track. But now those four bars are subjected to a repetition, and again Beethoven avoids literalness by two transformative devices. First, there is a dynamic transformation. That is, the first, these four bars are first stated Piano, crescendo to forte, right? But they are restated, forte, with a sudden drop to piano in the third bar. Did you hear that peculiar last note? There is the second transformation. And through it, we come upon a beautiful new ambiguity, a structural ambiguity, because that fourth bar initiates a whole string of repetitions, eight of them, in fact, and literal repetitions of that. But are they literal? Not on closer inspection, because they also are subjected to a dynamic transformation, this time crescendo to forte and diminuendo back to pianissimo. creates the metaphor of approaching and receding. But even that's not the main event. The masterstroke is that the fourth bar of that earlier four bar phrase, that fourth bar, which initiated this repetitive string, is also the first bar of the string itself. And we know this to be so because Beethoven marks the beginning of his crescendo on that very bar. Now, what does this mean? It means clearly that the four-bar phrase was really a three-bar phrase. Two, three. And that the eight-bar repetitive string is really a nine-bar string. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Three plus
plus 9. But we know this only in hindsight, after we've already heard it, right? Because what we first heard, or thought we heard, was four bars followed by eight. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then which is true? Three plus nine or four plus eight? And the answer is both are true. And the tension that results from that contradiction is what makes this ambiguity so beautiful and exciting. It's exactly the same contradiction producing ambiguity that you find in architecture and in painting and in the dance and in any of the arts when they are really great. That is usually what's going on. That's what grabs you. And then, as if nine repetitions weren't enough, Beethoven pretends to go on repeating. Only he drops out the accompaniment, another transformation, and then raises each repetition by one degree of the scale, yet another transformation, returning us in blissful satisfaction to our opening theme. Well, that's the beginning of the Pastoral Symphony, only the beginning, mind you, of only one movement. We've been analyzing approximately 30 seconds of music, music that continues for over 30 minutes. And even so, this has been a very limited analysis, showing only one aspect of the music, how a metaphorical language is created by transformations, which are varied repetitions. But this one aspect is probably the most fundamental and rewarding one in all musical analysis. Consider, for instance, the practice of sequence, which is another form of varied repetition. A sequence is simply a series of repetitions. I'm sure you all know what a sequence is, but I have to explain it anyway. Uh, it's simply a sequence, a series of repetitions of the same phrase on different degrees of the scale. Now, here's a very famous one from the development section of this symphony. Then a rising repeat. And then the sequence goes on. What's this new wrinkle? We've hit the minor mode. But only for a moment, and we're safely back in the major. Now, what happened? Why was that brief excursion into the minor so terribly moving? Do you realize that this is the only minor moment in the whole movement? It's as though suddenly, in the midst of all this cheerful, sunny music, for a second, one little cloud darkened the sun. Now there I go using an extrinsic <laughs> metaphor. Haven't I contradicted myself? What has minor to do with darkness or light or clouds or sun? Now that's one of the questions I'm most frequently asked by non-musicians. Why is the minor sad and the major glad? Isn't this proof of the affective theory of musical expression? And the answer is no. Whatever darkness or sadness or passion you feel when you hear music in the minor is perfectly explainable in purely phonological terms. If you think back to our very first lecture, when we discussed the harmonic series or overtones, remember? You'll recall that one of the earliest and most basic overtones is the major third. There, a strong consonant overtone which is clearly heard along with its fundamental. I don't know if this, if this piano will do that trick. You hear it? Well, it's that one anyway. And on a, on a bigger piano, you would hear it more clearly. There it is. And being so integral a part of the fundamental, it therefore contributes to the basic triad, which is also part of the fundamental, right? Then there's the basic triad. Now the minor third, which would turn that triad into a minor one, is a very late and remote overtone, way up here in the series. Way up here, overtone number 18, vibrating way up there so that when it is employed to create music in the minor, 
it is at variance with the major third, which is implicitly present in the fundamental. You see? And this creates what is called in acoustics interference, interference of frequencies, meaning that we are, so to speak, hearing both major and minor thirds at once. And this interference of the two frequencies causes a phonological disturbance, and we hear it as a disturbed quality, a troubled, unstable sound. And so we call minor music troubled, sad, unstable, dark, passionate, whatever. In other words, we translate a phonological disturbance into an emotional one. We are affected by it, like uh, Whatever subjective feelings we're going to report about that, they're going to be somewhere in the area of passion, dark, yearning, not, not satisfied, whatever. The very opposite of, right? Which is as major as it can be. Whereas this Bach violin sonata is immediately immediately passion because it's minor but we can explain it completely phonologically and so we come to realize that this so-called affective phenomenon of the minor mode is not basically an extrinsic metaphorical operation it is intrinsic to music and its meaning is a purely musical meaning as used here in the in this sequence of Beethoven's pastoral symphony is simply another metaphorical way of varying a repetition, although it's a very moving way. We are moved, but it is an in, but the meaning of it. Do you remember the the distinction I made earlier between meaning and expression? The meaning of it is intrinsically musical. But what are we to say of the long strings of unvaried repetitions that inhabit this same development section? Like this one. It's simply unbelievable. And yet, this is one of the most exciting passages in all music. How can it be so exciting if there's so much literal repetition? Why is there so much repetition in the symphony anyway? Granted that we know repetition to be a fundamental principle of all music, even the key to musical syntax, even so, why such an obsession with it in this particular work? Well, it could be suggested that this compulsive repeating on Beethoven's part is related to the programmatic nature of this pastoral piece, or the programmatic meaning, if you wish, after all, it's a nature piece, and the profuse re repetition could be a metaphor for the profuse repetitiveness of nature herself, the infinite reduplication of species, of jonquils and daisies and sparrows and poplars and mosquitoes, to say nothing of, of the regular movements of sun, star, stars, and moon. But this is not the kind of metaphor we're seeking at all, is it? because it's again extrinsic, it's ex extra musical, and we're after purely musical semantics. Then what is the musical metaphor to be discovered in that famous long passage of literal repeats? How do we account for that being exciting? Well, in a nutshell, it's to be found in the large design that is formed out of these bar-to-bar -bar repeats, bar-by-bar -bar repeats. We've been dealing so far with small patterns, you understand, two bar and four bar phrases, or maybe eight and nine bar phrases. But what we now see is a pattern of 92 bars, all to be comprehended together as one immense metaphorical design. 24 plus 22, which makes 46, and again 24 plus 22, another 46, which already reveals a large inner repetition. Now, don't panic. We're not going to slog through all those 92 bars. 
But we can look briefly at the design of the first 24. What are they, and what is their metaphorical meaning? Not jonquils and daisies, but notes and rhythms. Okay, we know where these notes come from, our well-known jaunty motive, right? Now transformed and transposed to B flat. Played four times by the first violins. Now this is then literally repeated by the second violins, doubled by a woodwind an octave higher. That makes eight bars, right? Now that eight bar segment is itself repeated and then re-repeated with slight transformations we won't discuss right now, but always with the same alternation of first violins as against second violins plus the high woodwind. And it's played three times in all, three times eight, making 24 bars. Now that's one way of looking at this episode from an orchestral point of view. We perceive one of Beethoven's intentions via his instrumental texture and the alternating high and low registers. But now let's view the same 24 bars harmonically, and we find a very different story. Four bars of B flat, as before, repeat as before in the second violin with the higher octave, that's eight, and then again the first violins, that's now 12 bars. And now a sudden switch of key to D major for 12 more bars. Now we're still following the same instrumental pattern, but in this new key of D, which is maintained for two more repeats. And finally, climax. Now this has been a totally different construction of those same 24 bars. It's two times 12. 12 bars in B flat and 12 bars in D. Not at all three times eight as we saw at first. In other words, there are two different orders of articulation, two different substructures functioning simultaneously within the single span of 24 bars. One order articulates the orchestral texture three times eight. You recognize that? And the other one articulates what Walter Piston called the harmonic rhythm. And that's two times 12, B flat and D. And the simultaneous contradiction of the two creates one glorious ambiguity. This is that, or better in this case, this but that. And thus is born a great musical metaphor out of what seemed to be merely 24 stupefying repetitions. Now at this point, I think any further analysis would involve us in truly stupefying repetitions. It's time now to hear the music performed, not in bits by me at the piano, but in its entirety by the Boston Symphony. And I hope it's time for you to listen to this music purely as music, as a magnificent utterance in a metaphorical language, a language of creative transformations. I hope you're somewhat prepared for this and to renounce the whole pastoral paraphernalia, jonquils and daisies included. It's not easy, but it's possible. It's even possible to get over the two stickiest wickets of all, namely the bird calls toward the end of the second movement, which Beethoven has even named in the score, again with his own hand, in the pen and ink, in his manuscript, nightingale, quail, and cuckoo. Now <laughs> just think of them as a little cadenza for three woodwinds before the final bars. There's plenty of precedent for that in the symphonies of Haydn, and don't forget that Haydn was a great model for Beethoven. And then that storm in the fourth movement. Even that blasted storm can be conceived structurally as a huge transition from the scherzo to the finale, which in a way it is, rather like the corresponding passage in Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which is indeed a transition from the scherzo to the finale. And don't forget that Beethoven was writing his Fifth and Sixth Symphonies practically simultaneously in the same year. And even if you can succeed in disregarding all these programmatic elements and substituting structural and transformational ones, you are still going to have a hard time ridding yourself of associations 
even unpastoral ones. This challenge I'm offering invites you to discard your customary listening habits of letting the music nudge you into nice passive association with personal memories and images, colors, random emotional states, all those experiences of synesthesia. <laughs> I am rashly suggesting that you change your habits on the spot, that you dump the whole synesthetic baggage, including Beethoven's own suggestive titles, and hear this marvelous example of symphonic metamorphosis as just that. I know how hard it is to do this. I, too, often have difficulty in uh, shedding extra musical associations. I could never listen to the finale of Tchaikovsky's Second Symphony without hearing that great tune in uh, G major in the last moment as a Cole Porter number, only because somebody at a party once delivered it that way. Music playing and palm trees swaying and donkeys braying and you were in my arms, dear. I'm stuck with it forever. I could never hear that symphony again without that lyric and it's like that old mental exercise, that uh, game of discipline. Don't think of an elephant for the next five seconds. Have you ever tried that? <laughs> Try it. Try it. Don't think of an elephant. One, two, three, four, five. How'd you do? Did you succeed? Well, maybe. Well, it's the same with listening to the Pastoral Symphony. It's a matter of not thinking of those elephants, which in this case are those birds and those storms and those shepherd's pipes and all the rest of it, and listen to the metaphors that I've been showing you. And some of you may resist, and some of you may even rebel. Some of you may say, but I like those centaurs and fawns of <laughs> Walt Disney, and I want to think of them when I hear this music. But give it a chance. I hope you'll try. Because at the very least, it's splendid self-discipline, very good for the character. <laughs> and at best, if you do succeed, you may be hearing a whole new piece by Beethoven. Good luck.
Thank you. It's very hard to say anything after that. I don't know to, to what extent you've succeeded in avoiding the elephant and the birds and the bees. And I doubt that any of you succeeded 100%, because as I warned you, it's almost impossible to divorce your minds from the associations that insist upon being there. But even if you, if you succeeded only partly, even 1%, you've accomplished a lot, because you've taken at least a first step toward new listening habits. And once you've begun to hear music as music only, then you're already over the toughest hurdle and well on your way toward a, a whole new way of listening to music. And to that extent, I congratulate you. This glorious piece we've been listening to, as I said before, is as close to program music as Beethoven ever came. And it placed him squarely in the vanguard of the surging programmatic movement that was to engage with increasing force the minds of romantic and impressionist composers for a whole century to come. And this intense preoccupation with literary and pictorial associations with its inevitable set of new ambiguities is going to be the area of our investigation in the next lecture. So until then, thank you for your patience. This has been a long one and not easy. Next week, more music and less linguistics. See you then.